Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Intro to Tech Equity webinar. It's 12.05, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Herman Calderon. I am the community manager at Tech Equity Collaborative. So in my role, I get to engage with our supporters through some of our event series, such as these. And I get to engage with you all here. So if you have any questions at all, make sure you drop those into the Q&A portion. And if you have anything, uh, any technical issues on the on the chat. So my colleague Megan Abel, also our Director of Advocacy, will be monitoring both of those. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Megan. As Herman said, um, I will be monitoring the Q&A and I'll answer some of the questions as we go along in the Q&A box, but we'll also save some of them for the end and answer them live. Um, my role at Tech Equity is Director of Advocacy, so I work to uh, create and to manage our campaigns um, and our coalition partnerships to move forward policy that builds a more equitable tech-driven economy. Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, just a little bit about what we'll be covering today. We're going to be talking about why Tech Equity exists as an organization and how we got started. We'll be talking about the key issues we've identified to help us understand the problems that need to be solved. And we'll talk about how we can take action to address our region's most pressing economic issues. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to say that May is also Affordable Housing Month, and we're partnering with Silicon Valley at Home to get the word out about about 35 events and activities that are taking place throughout the month. And the central message of Affordable Housing Month is that everyone deserves a safe, stable, and affordable home. And that message is more relevant now than ever before. So you can check out a full calendar of Affordable Housing Month events at Silicon Valley at Home's website. That's siliconvalley.org. Uh, for more opportunities to get involved with the, this month's activities throughout the South Bay. And you can also find more Bay Area wide uh, events around Affordable Housing Month at affordablehousingmonth.org if you're interested. So we'll get back into why we're here. So Tech Equity Collaborative got started because some of its founders and early members saw the symptoms of growing inequity within their neighborhoods and understood that there was a perception that tech and tech workers were the cause of the problem. They began to notice things like rising rents, displacement, increases in traffic, and an increase in people experiencing homelessness. And as they talked to others, they realized that they weren't alone in their concerns and that they as tech workers were uniquely positioned to help contribute to solutions. Especially now in the face of the pandemic, we're seeing the affordability crisis get so much worse with an increased burden placed on low income people and communities of color. Many of our neighbors are uncertain as how they'll continue to manage what was already an untenable situation. At the same time, tech workers have been relatively unscathed. And as a result, the COVID-19 crisis has the potential to further exacerbate inequality within our region. So this is the state of our crisis currently in the Bay Area. The fact that rents are rising, I don't think is too much of a surprise to anyone on this webinar because we already all know and feel this. And while some Californians are very successful in the tech-driven economy here, the average salaries for tenants have actually decreased slightly throughout the years. And this is really a sharp contrast with the narrative of tech success. And without tech at the table to work together to address our shared crisis, it's understandable as to why community members are frustrated. Before the pandemic, the unemployment rate was hovering just around the 4% mark, and people were already struggling to make ends meet. But since the virus hit, 1.6 million California, Californians have filed for unemployment. Meanwhile, experts believe it's not likely that rents will fall much during this economic downturn. Rents are more likely to flatline and people's incomes won't rebound quickly enough, so renters will actually be in a worse position overall. And as instability and uncertainty continues, we'll see more of our neighbors being pushed into homelessness or worse. And as I said, communities are frustrated. And considering the graph that we just looked at, it really comes to no surprise. I know for myself, I've grown up in the Bay Area my whole life, and I've been able to see both sides of the coin. I have friends and family, who are worried about the changes they see in their communities and what that means for them. But I also have friends and family who have pursued jobs within the tech industry and have found lots of success. 
However, we still see that tech is shouldering the blame for a lot of our region's issues, and it's creating an us versus them dynamic that's further dividing our community. We know that tech workers care and that they want to help, and they don't want to contribute to this deepening divide within our region. And while we're all unsure as to how we'll be managing this new normal caused by the virus, it's important to note that many in the tech sector remain relatively unscathed. More than most other sectors, tech has been able to make the transition to working from home with little disruption. And now more than ever, tech workers and tech companies have an opportunity to support more equitable solutions in our communities. And we have an opportunity to, you, to use our unique position of privilege to support our neighbors, but it can be hard to know how to best engage in times of such uncertainty. Because of this affordability crisis, which is now compounded by the virus, we're at risk of losing so many critical components within our community that make the Bay Area a hub of diversity and innovation. And over the last few decades, housing costs have skyrocketed due in part to limited supply. So the housing crisis was already incredibly challenging for many families prior to COVID-19. And now as thousands are filing for unemployment weekly, already unaffordable rents are impossible to meet. And as a result, we've seen longtime residents being forced out, and we've seen how difficult it is for lower and middle income people to live near their jobs. While some workers are finding success, many others are struggling to make ends meet. And families that were already challenged by the status quo are now finding themselves unable to weather this crisis. But we don't think that it has to be this way. At Tech Equity, we're as optimistic as ever about the tech industry's potential to drive broad-based growth that's accessible to everyone, but it's clear that it won't happen on its own. We can make it out of this crisis together stronger than we were before, but only if we invest in the people and institutions that are serving our communities. We have to show up and we have to do so in partnership with those in the community that are feeling the most pain if we're ever to dismantle this notion that tech is the enemy. We believe that a more engaged tech sector is a more ethical tech sector. That connecting tech workers and companies to issues where they live in will result in more ethical decisions at work and more engagement within our communities. We know we can do this and the first step is to show up. And you all have done a great first step by signing on to this webinar and joining the conversation today. Our goal is to change the conditions in which the tech sector is grown. We believe that effective structural change will eliminate a culture and policies that have institutionalized inequity, leading to stronger and more resilient communities. We help tech workers approach these big problems and engage in this system change in three major ways. So our programs educate you about the most critical civic issues where you live. And we do this through book club discussions that we host, panel discussions with ex experts, webinars, and voter guides. We activate you on a policy advocacy agenda that results in a more inclusive economy in your community. We do this through voter turnouts, signature gathering, and lobbying. And finally, we connect you on a personal level to the community you live in and the people who live there outside of your tech bubble through our programming and campaigns that we're helping out with. The good news is that members at Tech Equity are showing up for the community. Tech workers are members of the community and should be at the table working alongside non-tech community members. We can advocate for solutions to our most pressing shared problems. COVID-19 has shown us that the health of our community depends on all of us, and we have to work together to address these underlying issues that are driving inequity within our tech economy. At Tech Equity Collaborative, we have two focus areas, which are housing and workforce and labor. So while housing costs are a core part of the issue, the issues really are intertwined because where you live affects your access to opportunity and what job you have affects where you're able to afford to live. Our goal is bold, comprehensive change by companies and government led by the tech workforce. And these issues have only gotten more urgent in the face of the pandemic. And we're all well positioned to adapt our agenda to these new realities. So let's learn a little bit more about inequity within our neighborhoods. The affordability crisis really is decades in the making. The policy choices that we've made over the course of decades have set us up for this 
level of pain our community is feeling, especially now during COVID-19. In the 1930s, the federal government instituted a policy that's still felt today, especially by communities of color in the Bay Area, and that policy is redlining. So redlining was a process in which the homeowners loan corporation, a federal agency, gave neighborhoods ratings to guide investment. And this policy is named for the red or hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed riskiest. So on maps, those neighborhoods were literally redlined, as we can see on the image on the screen. And those communities that were deemed risky investments or redlined didn't receive any investment. And these neighborhoods were predominantly home to communities of color, and that really is by no accident. The hazardous rating was in large part based on racial demographics. So in other words, redlining was a discriminatory and a racist policy. It made it hard for residents to get loans for home ownership or for maintenance of their homes for something like building a new roof. And consequently, redlining led to cycles of disinvestment, including development and production within these neighborhoods. So there's actually a terrible history of underinvestment, underbuilding, and exclusion in the Bay Area. Often, those communities that have been historically underinvested in and have been redlined are the very same neighborhoods and communities that are at risk of gentrification today. So this crisis really is decades in the making. It's started way before tech, and it's not unique to the Bay Area. There are many cases of redlining all throughout California and all throughout the U.S. So by preventing entire neighbor, neighborhoods from accessing capital, these neighborhoods were unable to build the schools they needed, small businesses, and a community that fostered economic success and opportunity for everyone. And it caused many of the people who lived within these red line neighborhoods for generations to fall in and stay in liquid asset poverty. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what is liquid asset poverty? Well, someone is considered to be in liquid asset poverty if they don't have enough savings to cover their basic expenses for three months after experiencing an income shock, like the global pandemic that we're currently in. Other examples are a huge rent increase, a loss of a job, things like that. And it impacts almost one out of two Californians. So 46% of Californians are in liquid asset poverty and people of color and low and low-income people are affected at much higher rates. So 67% of Latino households are in liquid asset poverty and 63% of African-American households are in liquid asset poverty. And there really isn't a single reason as to why this is happening. Many years of policy decisions have led to these outcomes, which are really burdensome for communities of color. And these policy decisions often predate tech's arrival but tech workers can now take a role in supporting better policies moving forward. Twin forces of a housing shortage, particularly affordable housing and wages that don't cover the cost of living have created a regional crisis that has hindered opportunity, growth and prosperity for families and businesses alike. As you can imagine, these statistics will likely be impacted by the outcome of the current pandemic we're in and many people in we're already struggling with unemployment on a steep rise and city and state budgets that are being depleted by emergency response efforts. Many of our neighbors are facing increased instability and likely will for years to come if we don't implement the necessary solutions now. So the cost of living here were already high. So let's take a look at how a worker earning minimum wage fares in the current rental market. So this is what it takes to afford the average two bedroom apartment in San Francisco. So if you're making $120,000 per year, you can afford the average two bedroom working a normal eight hour day. However, if you're making minimum wage in San Francisco, you need to work 30 hours a day to be able to afford that two bedroom. So there are only 24 hours in a day, so we're actually setting up an impossible situation for low wage workers to be able to afford living in the city. And just to keep it in context, it's not just people outside the tech sector that are struggling to afford San Francisco. There's a common misconception that all tech workers are paid these lavish salaries. However, not every salary, salaried employee is making six figures. Some salaried tech employees like those in customer success or marketing 
paid salaries that are still considered to be low income within the Bay Area. And even further from this image of a wealthy tech worker are the thousands of contracted and contingent workers like security guards, custodians, bus drivers, cooks, who are working long hours to maintain tech companies, but are receiving minimum benefits and are not paid as much. So you have to have a good salary to afford your apartment. But why is your apartment so expensive to begin with? Well, rents are going up due in part to lack of supply. And this chart is showing us what we should be building. The state sets goals for how much housing local communities should build in order to keep up with demand and population growth. And these are called RHNA goals, abbreviated as RENA, or Regional Housing Needs Allocation. As you can see, we're doing a pretty good job at meeting our RENA goal for the above moderate income housing bracket. So that's affordable to people making that good salary we talked about earlier. But we're not building anywhere close enough housing for lower and moderate income people. And as housing costs have skyrocketed with production of affordable housing not being matched, working class residents and communities of color have been driven out of our urban core and pushed into the outer edges of our region, further away from job centers and supportive services. Some residents have been displaced from the region altogether. So remember when someone tells you that we just need to build more housing, it's important that you ask them, build more housing for whom? Again, we're not building enough housing at lower levels of affordability. And because we're not building enough housing that's affordable for lower and middle income people, they're leaving our communities, uh, higher income folks are coming in and staying in. So for every high income person that's coming into the Bay Area, a low income person is being pushed out at about a one to one ratio. So displacement really is driven by policy choices. And we may see this ratio of displacement continue to rise as COVID-19 continues to progress. The folks who are the most rent burdened are often in low wage jobs and low wage jobs are getting hit the hardest by this crisis. And we can't build our way out to solve our problems, but it is true that we don't have enough homes for people. So as you can see, the affordability crisis we're living in today is a result of years and years of bad policy choices. The good news is that we can make a different set of choices moving forward. So at Tech Equity, we envision a world where a growing tech-driven economy creates opportunity for everyone and where tech sector employees and companies are engaged and active participants in making our community a better place to live. So we've identified structural changes that need to happen in order to achieve this vision, but we won't be able to achieve this without the necessary policy change. So here's what we've identified in the housing world. I'm gonna be given a brief overview of these, but if you have any questions, make sure you drop them into the Q&A box. We need to take an above all approach to tackling our housing affordability crisis, and that starts with production, preservation, and protection. So production, we need to make sure that we're building more housing, specifically at lower levels of affordability. And we can do this through zoning and permitting reform that brings down the cost of housing by removing delays and lengthy administrative processes that make it too expensive to build. Preservation. We need to make sure that we're providing more resources to subsidize and maintain and improve existing affordable housing, affordable housing that we already have. And last, protection. We need to protect existing tenants from displacement. So it's gonna take a long time to build the housing that we need, but in the meantime, we need to protect existing tenants from displacement. Especially now, we need to be thinking about short and long-term solutions to preservation and protection. Many of our neighbors are more at risk than ever before, and an economic downturn is also an ideal time to lean heavily into producing more affordable housing as the cost of labor, materials, and land may decrease slightly within these market conditions that we're currently in. We also need to make sure that everyone is getting enough compensation and benefits to live a healthy and stable life. And we want to ensure that companies are doing their part to contribute to the communities they exist within, that people within these surrounding communities are able to access these jobs, and that these jobs are paying fair wages and benefits, regardless of the role. 
So we were excited to see that companies were stepping up and committing to continue paying their contingent workers as their offices were closed due to the pandemic. But we want to ensure that that same care goes into supporting these workers well beyond the pandemic we're in. So for this, we need to make sure that there are equitable on-ramps. There needs to be more access to good paying, high opportunity jobs. We need corporate responsibility. Want to make sure that companies need to be conscious of their impact in their communities and need to work with community leaders and organizations to ensure their economic success is benefiting their neighbors as well. And finally, we need to make sure that all jobs are good jobs, that contractors and contingent workers are treated fairly. So once again, there are tons of ways that you can get involved with Tech Equity Collaborative. We host tons of educational events. We have monthly event series that you can sign on to to go deeper on some of the issues that we talked about today. Uh, just in fact, next week on Tuesday, May 12th, we're hosting a virtual Ignites event where we're, we'll be hearing um, solutions from our community about how to address COVID-19. We also have monthly member meetings, uh, exclusive content for members and an opportunity for our members to weigh in on some of our endorsements and policy platforms. So if you're interested in becoming a member, you can do so at techequitycollaborative.org slash membership. If you're interested in advocacy, you can volunteer to support our campaign to close corporate property tax loopholes and restore $12 billion every year that California communities need, especially now to recover from this crisis. Or you can help us with corporate policy through our responsible contracting campaigns. And the final way you can engage with us is through engaging with your community. So we connect tech workers with non-tech community members through volunteering. So you can volunteer for COVID-19 relief. Uh, we've partnered with community organizations that are providing rapid response services to keep our community digitally connected. And if you're a designer or an engineer, you can volunteer for our civic tech projects where we're building digital tools that are supporting renters and underserved communities to get access to the information that they need. So this is how we work. We try to make it as accessible and as easy as possible to plug in, but also build community in the process. So what can you do today? You can do three things right after you get this call. You can tell a friend about our work. You can become a member of Tech Equity. So building a more equitable Bay Area means that we all need to pitch in and we're at it every day serving as that conduit between tech workers and the hard work of creating opportunity and prosperity for everyone. And one of the easiest ways you can do your part is by donating. Your financial support means that we can be a powerful voice for our community as we seek solutions to some of our region's biggest challenges. And finally, you can take action on one of our campaigns, which I'll be talking about next. So the first campaign we have is Prop 13 Reform, also known as Schools and Local Communities Funding Act. So local governments from public health departments to school districts are leading the fight currently against COVID-19. However, because of California's broken property tax system, they're doing it without all the resources that they need. So our coalition, Schools and Communities First, has successfully submitted 1.7 million signatures to qualify our initiative for the November 2020 ballot. And it will bring back $12 billion to our schools and communities by closing a corporate tax loophole and making sure that corporations are paying their fair share in taxes. So if you're interested in this campaign, you can support it by sharing your story about why funding our local services is so vital or by volunteering to phone bank to contact voters. The next campaign we have is the Fair Chance at Housing campaign, also known as Banning the Box in Alameda County. So this campaign helps remove barriers for formerly incarcerated people to have more access to housing after being released from prison. So we successfully had an ordinance passed in Oakland and in Berkeley in partnership with the organization Just Cities. So for this campaign, you can sign up or donate to support these efforts as they continue to expand uh, throughout the entirety of Alameda County. And the last campaign we have is the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which really highlights the work that we do at Tech Equity Collaborative and how we partner with community organizations and center the needs of people who are feeling 
the pain of the affordability crisis more acutely than most of us in tech. So working alongside community partners, legislators, and relevant stakeholders, we were able to identify a new policy intervention that could protect more renters than any law before in California history. So this policy prevents tenants from arbitrary and unjust evictions by requiring landlords to have a good cause for evicting a tenant. It also prevents unfair rent increases and prevents price gouging by capping rent increases at no more than 10%. So as a result of our strong coalition, we were able to introduce a bill to the California legislator that was signed into law last October in 2019. So the Tenant Protection Act now extends protections to 8 million California renters. But passing the law on its own uh, wasn't enough. We also wanted to ensure that tenants knew their rights and could advocate for themselves. So we reached out to our volunteers at Tech Equity who donated their skills and their time to create a new website that would help tenants navigate their rights under this new law. So that website is live, it's called tenantprotections.org and it's already been used by thousands of renters. So if you're a renter or if you know someone who's a renter and they'd like to see how this law applies to their situation, make sure you all check it out. Once again, that's tenantprotections.org. So once again, you can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about our work, you can join us by becoming a member, or you can take action on one of our campaigns. And finally, just wanted to say that COVID-19 has exposed how deep the cracks in our economy and our communities run. And when cities start setting aside issues like housing and fair labor conditions, it deepens our inequity and leaves us vulnerable to things like future recessions, future pandemics, and more. And because we've already overlooked these issues in the Bay Area, it could set us back years in terms of recovery. So if you take one thing away from this presentation, we hope it's the realization that more equity within our neighborhoods actually strengthens our economy and safeguards us from a future crisis. So we hope you'll join us in advocating for a future that works for everyone. So I'm sure that was quite a bit of information to absorb. So now is the time for questions. So as I mentioned before, Megan Abel, our Director of Advocacy, is joining us for this portion and will be helping to answer some questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Herman, for an amazing uh, presentation. Um, and we've already got some questions that have been submitted into the Q&A box. Um, so I'll kick it off with those, but um, feel free to continue to submit more as we uh, go through these first few questions here. Um, so the first question that we have is from um, an anonymous attendee that asks, uh, this is my first introduction to tech equity. Who are the people behind it? And is the org supported directly by big tech companies? Tell me more about who you are. Um, so our organization was founded by Catherine Bracey. Um, she still serves as our executive director. And Catherine's background is really at the intersection of tech and civic life. Um, she kind of got her start in this work um, as um, working on the Obama campaign where she organized technologists um, in the Bay Area to open the Obama campaign's Office of Technology, um, where tech workers were building campaign infrastructure um, to help bring uh, the former president uh, to victory in 2008. Um, so she really got a lot of experience kind of understanding how tech workers want to be involved, how they can contribute to their community, and how they can use their skills um, in order to um, support that type of work. Um, she then went on to be one of the early members of Code for America, um, and then after a few years at Code for America, left to um, found Tech Equity. Um, so um, that's a little bit about our founder's background um, on a broader sense. Um, we are funded by a combination of sources. Um, so as Herman mentioned, um, we do have a membership um, that's just made up of rank and file tech workers, um, everyday people like the folks that are on this call right now. Um, those members typically give us $10 a month and provide kind of the grassroots support that we need to help to support our work. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a member, you can do that at techequitycollaborative.org slash membership. Um, like most other nonprofits, we're also founded by or also funded by foundations and grants um, that are provided by those foundations. 
Um, we do have some private donors that are on a larger scale as well. Um, and then we do also have a corporate partnerships program. Um, and this is where companies um, pay us to provide educational programming to their employees. Um, so we'll give talks at tech companies similar to the one that Herman just gave right now, um, but also ones that maybe go deeper on certain topic areas. Um, so for example, we've given talks at tech companies before about um, all of the specific things that go into building a unit of housing from the cost of construction to permitting um, in order to help tech workers to understand why it's expensive and why it's difficult to build housing in the Bay Area. Um, and what are some of the things that we need to change in order to make housing more affordable. Um, so we do have some of that um, funding as well. Um, if you want to see a full breakdown of kind of what our organization does, um, exactly all the different foundations and donors who are supporting our work, um, you can definitely check that information out on our website, on our annual report um, that covers all of those basics. Um, and I've just dropped the link into the chat for that annual report um, as well. So hopefully that answers your question um, about the background of our organization. Um, the next question that I have is, how is your work informed by community members? How are they involved in what you all set up in terms of programs and the direction that your organization is headed in? Well, our membership does have a big um, influence um, into uh, the work that we do. We ask our members to weigh in on things like our policy priorities and our electoral endorsements. Um, so we certainly try to incorporate the voice of our community of members into the work that we do. Um, in addition to that, we have a team of advisors um, that come from a broad swath of community organizations kind of all over the spectrum. Um, we have housing advisors and workforce and labor advisors who weigh in on all of our policy platforms and the direction of our work um, to help to give a more kind of well-rounded perspective. Um, and those advisors, for example, on the housing side, um, you know, some of them are sort of pro-development people, some of them are um, anti-displacement tenant advocates. So we've tried to be conscious of including people on our advisory board um, who come from kind of a broad spectrum of political backgrounds when it come to, comes to the issue set. Um, if you're interested in learning about who our advisors are um, and um, what kind of role they play in our work, um, you can also find that on our website. Um, and I'll drop the link for that one as well in just a second here. Got to let it load. And if I may add, Megan, um, also a lot of the work that we do uh, is in coalition with other uh, community organizations. So, for example, Schools and Communities First, we're a part of a statewide coalition uh, with a range of stakeholders. So there are unions on there. There are community organizations, small businesses. Um, for the Ban the Box um, campaign, we're in partnership with the organization Just Cities. Um, and then for the Tenant Protection Act as well, we were involved with um, different legislators, um, different community organizations. So we try to always uh, be in partnership with different organizations so that we are still connected to the community and also to serve as that bridge between um, tech, uh, tech workers and non-tech community members. Yeah, that's a great addition, Herman, and kind of leads into the next question, which is how well is tech equity received by existing advocates? Has it been hard to be seen as true allies with the tech as the problem narrative that exists um, around displacement? Um, and I would say like, yeah, definitely it was a challenge at the beginning of our organization. Um, we're a relatively new nonprofit and tech workers, like you said, are not necessarily a trusted ally within the community. Um, and we really see um, helping to build that bridge between tech and the rest of the community and activating tech workers as allies as being key to solving the affordability crisis that we have here in the Bay Area. And um, the scale of the problem is so large that if we're not all working together and trying to move in the same direction, um, it's going to be pretty difficult to solve the issue or to get anything done. Um, so while it is a challenge, we see it as being incredibly necessary to bring tech workers in as allies and to add capacity um, to the existing struggle for equity. Um, but we're also very conscious of the fact that there are allies that, or sorry, there are organizations that have been in this fight for a lot longer than we have. 
Um, and there are communities and groups of people within the Bay Area that are feeling the pain of this affordability crisis way more than tech workers are. Um, and so we try to be conscious of that positioning um, and act as allies in this conversation um, rather than coming in and saying, hey, we're going to solve this, right? So as Herman mentioned, um, we really take the lead of these organizations that are feeling the pain the most, that are closest to the problem, um, and we work in coalition with those groups on all of our campaigns. Um, so there's not a single campaign that we have that we've sort of, you know, cooked up on our own and decided that this is the solution. Um, it's more about having conversations with all of those stakeholders, trying to get to consensus about what a solution could be, and then figuring out how we can leverage the resources that our community of tech workers represents to move the needle on those issues. Um, and I have to say that, you know, while it was a struggle at first to build that trust, we have been successful in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 that Herman mentioned is actually a good example of this. Um, the Tenant Protection Act was sponsored by a group of tenant advocates. Um, and those groups have been particularly wary of tech workers and the effect that the tech economy has had on displacement and gentrification. Um, and uh, when we first started to have conversations with those groups, they actually didn't want us to join the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 coalition because they were, you know, not really sure who we were, what we were about, um, and if we could be trusted. Um, and building relationship and showing that we were down to show up in community with them and take their lead um, really did build that bridge. And we were eventually invited on to be co-sponsors of the legislation. We helped to build tenantprotections.org, the website that supports the implementation of that law. Um, and that very same group of tenant organizations that sponsored the Tenant Protection Act last year we're in conversation with them about how we can move forward a new set of policy priorities this year as well. And you know, they reached out to us this time to say, hey, Tech Equity, this is what we're doing. Are you on board to help us? Um, so we've really seen a huge transformation in terms of what the relationship looks like between um, those traditionally marginalized groups and our organization. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, I want to move on to a question now from Gabriel, who says, I see this is being recorded. Where can we find the recording afterwards? Um, can we share this presentation with family, friends, and coworkers? Um, great question, Gabriel. Yes, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you a link to the recording right after this webinar concludes. Um, and we'll also provide some follow-up links. So if you didn't get a chance to you know, click on some of the, the links that I provided in the chat, um, that will be included in the email as well. You're more than welcome to share this presentation far and wide. Um, the larger our community of tech workers are, um, the more that we can create impact as an organization. So definitely the more the merrier. Um, I also wanna mention that we do host this Intro to Tech Equity webinar on a monthly basis. Um, so you can also share an invitation to a future webinar um, if people wanna be able to engage live and, and ask questions and all the sort of stuff that you're able to do on this webinar with us today. Um, but yes, please do share this around. Um, next question I have is, are you mainly focused on work within California or do you work in other areas of the US? Um, so right now our work is only focused on California. We're a relatively young organization. We got started just about three years ago and we're a small but mighty team. Um, so uh, we're working right now on just creating impact in the state of California, learning what we can about what this work looks like here. Um, but certainly we recognize that the tech economy is having impacts in other areas. Um, there are major tech hubs across the country, you know, cities like Denver, Portland, Austin, Texas, Atlanta, um, just to name a few are also experiencing similar dynamics to what we have here in the Bay Area. Um, but I think you could argue that what we're experiencing with the tech economy here and the affordability crisis that has ensued is uh, more critical than probably anywhere else in the country, which is why we're focusing on learning the lessons that we can here first. Um, and, uh, you know, if you know any uh, funders who want to fund our expansion to other states, you know, we welcome those conversations. Um, but for now, we're just focused on California. 
Um, next question I have is I'm seeing that you're aligned with the three P's um, and does that mean that you're aligned with NPH, CASA and others? Um, so yeah, we um, are a part of the CASA conversation um, with NPH um, and working coalition with a lot of housing organizations that kind of fall under that umbrella, um, including Baja. So um, yeah, we're very, very plugged into that scene. And I think the three P's um, sort of framework is something that is really exciting to me um, in the housing world because um, it used to be that, you know, people that were pro-development and people that were anti-displacement were really pitted against each other and it was really seen as an either or thing. And through the three P's uh, strategy and the conversation that happened around the CASA Compact, um, we're finally starting to see some consensus in the housing community about a strategy and a pathway moving forward. Um, so we're really excited to be um, a part of that conversation. Um, the next question I have here is, um, could you speak to the fact that increasingly high affordable housing in lieu fees and inclusionary housing requirements are a major barrier to additional housing development in the Bay Area? Um, that's probably a longer answer than we have time for today. Um, but for those of you who are not aware of what inclusionary housing or in lieu fees are, um, some cities, not all cities, but some cities have a requirement that when a new apartment building goes up that a certain number of units within that building um, must be built um, to accommodate uh, below market rate housing. So the housing that's affordable to people that are at lower income levels. Um, so just as an example, if you have a hundred unit apartment building that has been permitted to be built, and there is a 20% inclusionary requirement um, in the city where that's being built. That would mean that of the 100 apartment units that are going up, 20 of those would need to be offered at that lower rent rate that's affordable to um, lower income folks within the community. Um, and so the attendees uh, question is sort of like, is this a barrier to additional housing development in the Bay Area? Um, and uh, the experts are really divided on this and there's a lot of discourse about whether inclusionary is the right thing to do or not. Um, so I fear that I don't have time to answer this in great detail um, on this call, but it's certainly a worthy um, discussion and uh, we have a couple of blog posts um, that uh, talk about our positions on these things as well um, that I can point you to. Um, the next question that I have here is, is there any hope of expanding Prop 13 reform to include residential beneficiaries? Wouldn't that provide even more property taxes to support the public services needed to support a more equitable and affordable community for all? So for those of you who are unaware, um, there was a, a ballot measure that was passed back in 1978 called Proposition 13. Um, and that applies to both um, commercial properties as well as residential properties alike. Um, and what Prop 13 does is it makes you pay property taxes um, based on the purchase price of the property rather than the fair market value of the property. I'm boiling this down to very simplistic levels for the sake of time. There are some exceptions to that um, and caveats, um, but for all intents and purposes, that's basically what Prop 13 does. Um, so even if you bought a building for, you know, $100,000 back in 1980, if it's worth a million dollars today, you're still paying property taxes based off of that $100,000 valuation rather than that million dollar current market value. And obviously the gap between those two amounts creates quite a gap in the amount of property tax revenue that we're collecting. As Herman mentioned on the, um, the slide deck earlier, we are part of a coalition called Schools and Communities First to reform Prop 13 um, and make it so that commercial and industrial properties pay fair market value on their taxes. And this would raise $12 billion in funding for schools and local services annually. Prop 13 reform under the Schools and Communities First version does not include any reforms to residential property. Um, so their Prop 13, um, tax rates would remain intact. Um, and uh, our kind of basic perspective on this is that we do think 
that for tax purposes, commercial properties and residential properties should be treated differently. Um, and if you believe that that's true, um, even if you don't like the way that residential properties are treated under Prop 13, um, but you agree that they should be treated differently and not taxed exactly the same, then that means we need to handle those as two separate issues and as two separate ballot measures. Um, so Schools and Communities First endeavors only to deal with the commercial side, um, and that's what we're focused on for the near term. Um, and we hope you join us in that campaign to support Prop 13 reform for commercial and industrial properties. Um, the next question is, are there any additional tools from tech that are that the collaborative is considering? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you're referencing. If you could maybe clarify um, by submitting an additional question or clarify in the chat for me. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting the direction of your question. Herman, do you know what they're referencing? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Um, the next question is, is, if every high income resident bumps one low income resident out of the bay, doesn't that argue for more housing at all income levels? Market rate housing uh, can make a big difference in creating a larger housing stock that would allow more people to stay. Um, yeah, we need to build more housing at all levels of affordability. Um, the reason why we emphasize that we need to build more affordable housing um, is because the chart that Herman showed earlier demonstrates that we're doing a particularly bad job of building uh, low to moderate income housing. Um, so we would like to see all of these bars at 100%, right? Um, that would be the ideal circumstances that we're building enough housing at all income levels for everyone. Um, the higher income kind of market rate housing is doing an okay job on its own, right? We're at 89% and 80% respectively um, for the Bay Area. Um, so we're not putting a ton of emphasis on building market rate housing because it seems to be doing okay uh, under current market conditions on its own. Um, what we need to focus on is more resource uh, and more production of below market rate housing. Um, and that's why our talk kind of emphasizes that section of things. Doesn't mean that we don't think that building more housing at market rate is also important. It just doesn't really seem to need as much help. Um, great. Any additional questions or um, the person who asked the tools from tech question, if you want to clarify, um, I'm just going to check the chat really briefly here to see if I'm missing anything. Um, Daniel says, hi, my name's Daniel Sarolu. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Like to help uh, with the cause and the work that Tech Equity is doing to open other chapters in other cities. Are you okay with my proposition? Um, Daniel, if you can send an email to us at info at techequitycollaborative.org, um, we'd love to chat with you in a little bit more detail offline. Um, Christopher Logan says, can you quickly plug out the census? California response rate is currently at 50%. Um, well, I guess you did your own plug by me reading that chat. <laughs> Um, great. Another question we have here is why is it that the conversation around housing always seems to be centered around private builders? Why don't, why don't we rethink public housing? Much of the problems with public housing lies with the structural racism that went into implementation, uh, but doesn't make the idea of public housing itself wrong. Why isn't this something that we revisit? Um, yeah, we certainly think that we need to implement uh, a ton of solutions, uh, including uh, construction of uh, publicly developed affordable housing. Um, we have a real problem when it comes to funding that housing. Um, we used to um, have a, a funding stream for public housing particularly that was called uh, redevelopment um, that was eliminated by Governor Brown in his um, attempt to balance the budget and create the rainy day fund. Um, and there have been several conversations in Sacramento around reinstituting that stream of funding to allow for more production of affordable housing. Um, but we have a real funding issue here in California um, do, that leads back to Prop 13 in a lot of ways and our campaign for schools and communities first. Um, so one big question is, is not just, you know, do we have the will to produce public housing? Um, the big, big, bigger question I think is, do we have the funding for it? And the answer right now is not really. Oh, I my dog's barking. 
Um, next thing that we have is from Jay. He says your graph on percent of low, moderate, above income housing could make it stronger by showing the percent of the population that actually falls into each category. For example, if 80% of housing permitted is directly at above, wow, my dog just won't stop barking. <laughs> Um, actually, Herman, do you want to? Yeah, 80% uh, of housing permitted is directly uh, above income when above income population is only X percent. Not really a question, but a comment. Uh, great. Uh, we appreciate the comment. Um, if there are any other questions uh, before we wrap up, we have about five minutes left. I'm so sorry about that. Joys of working from home with a dog, as I'm sure you all understand. <laughs> That's all right. I uh, just said we have five minutes left. So if anyone has any additional questions, maybe we can answer one more. Um, we've got a final question here, which says, thanks so much for starting this important conversation. What are you most excited about for tech equity? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm really excited to see tech workers getting involved in their community and, um, you know, looking at their time here in the Bay Area as not just a transitory phase in their career or in their life, but actually investing in what it means to be a resident of the Bay Area and of the community. Um, I used to work in tech myself um, and uh, came uh, to tech equity into this work um, from a stint uh, in the tech sector. Um, and I really have seen a, a transformation um, in my work uh, in tech workers wanting to have this conversation um, in kind of shedding some of the fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Um, and prioritizing um, listening and learning and being involved. Um, so my hope is that um, we can continue to drive that conversation forward and that tech workers uh, won't be so wary to participate um, and will want to engage and that we can create a community that's open and thoughtful and where those conversations can occur. So thanks for being a part of that on this webinar today. Herman, do you have thoughts about what you're most excited for? Uh, most excited for just to see uh, us expand, you know, like, as you mentioned, Megan, there, there are different um, tech hubs all throughout uh, the US. So um, as long as we get it right here in the Bay Area, and we see, I mean, there's already an increasing momentum, and we're already doing great work, like you said, with the small team. So just excited to see us expand and, and have more supporters um, everywhere. Yeah, and Tyler uh, has a question that kind of adds on to this, which is what is Tech Equity's biggest need given the new reality that we're in? Um, I think the work that we're doing around housing and workforce and labor um, is even more um, urgent and vital um, given the new reality under COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the need to protect uh, workers, particularly low wage workers, um, is more apparent than ever. Um, the fact that our social safety net for workers is lacking, um, is more, important, more apparent than ever. Um, so I think that um, our, our direction when it comes to the need for um, accessible, affordable housing for everyone and um, wage sustaining or family sustaining good wage jobs that are safe, um, those remain true and just even more urgent under the current kind of coronavirus reality um, so, uh, I think for me, it's just added urgency and fire to the platform that we've been working on for a long time. Um, and with that urgency, um, I think there's also going to be sort of an increase to the scale of the problem. Um, so of course, um, we need more members, uh, to be a part of this grassroots base of people to push for change, um, and, uh, hopefully some more funding so that we could expand this work even further. Um, so I would say those are the biggest needs given the, the current situation. 
So with that, it is 12.59. We are right on time. Um, so I'm going to end it here. Thank you everyone for your time today and uh, leaning in on these issues. If you have additional questions that you didn't get a chance to ask during the call today, feel free to shoot us an email at info at techequitycollaborative.org. We would love to continue the conversation there. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and keep Thanks, an eye everyone. out for that follow-up.